Stacy Scaldo, I'm one of the professors here. I teach a whole bunch of different classes. I love teaching all different classes. Um, I teach uh, in the first year curriculum. I teach Torx 1 and Torx 2. And that is basically the class on civil wrongs. It's actually it's called Twist, right? It's called twist. So it's um, civil wrongs. And it's basically the civil equivalent of all the stuff that you see in the news that are criminal law stuff, right? So if you hit somebody over the head with a hammer, you're probably going to, maybe, maybe, you'll be arrested, right? And put in jail or go through a criminal trial for having you know, committed an assault and battery against somebody. But there's also a civil side to that as well. Um, and I teach the civil side to it. So again, I teach torts. We talk about intentional torts and we talk about negligence really our baseline cause of action in the law of torts, the reasonably prudent person standard. It's pretty much when you see a car accident and somebody just forgot to put their turn signal on, right? That's negligence, okay, more or less. And there's all different types of negligence that exist. Uh, we talk about strict liability issues, common law strict liability, like blasting things, right? Um, we talk about products liability, okay, what happens when you get a box of cereal and there are metal fragments in the cereal, right? Is that a manufacturing defect? Is it a design defect? Is it a warning label defect? Probably not a warning label defect, because why on earth would they warn against metal fragments when they're not supposed to be there to begin with, right? Probably not a design defect, because who would design something to put metal fragments in a box of cereal? So it's probably a manufacturing defect. Something went wrong on the conveyor belt, right? And a bunch of metal landed in a whole stock of of frosted maybes, which is actually what happened a couple years ago. So when you see recalls for cans of tomatoes and things like that, that's that product liability type stuff. Um, so that's what I teach for the first year curriculum. I also teach what is primarily a third year class. We call it remedies. Um, it's basically what you get once you know you're right. Damages, right? Injunctions, different things like that. Because uh, it's one thing to be able to argue that you are entitled to some type of relief. It's a whole other thing to know what that relief is. And it's really important to know what to ask for. Because if you don't ask for the right thing, your client's not going to get it. And then, ooh, now practice cause of action. Oops. So um, we t I teach remedies as well. That's also a really good class. And then um, I teach, oh goodness, I teach professional responsibility as legal ethics. So that's also a fun time. I'm going to do a little problem today with legal ethics, professional responsibility stuff. That basically oversees all of the law, right? You're admitted to practice in a particular jurisdiction, and you have to abide by the ethical rules of that jurisdiction, right? So client tells you something that's confidential. Can you tell anybody else? Under certain circumstances, you can. Under certain circumstances, you can't, right? Is there a conflict of interest in representing this particular client because you represented the adversary in a past case, right? Or you are representing the adversary in a different case. Or you've already told the adversary that you're going to represent them, right? That's a clear one. So um, different things like that with regard to professional responsibility. Um, and then I also teach, I used to, I started out as a legal writing teacher. And I absolutely love to write. So my first job out of law school was as a law clerk for an appellate judge. And my second job was a law clerk for a federal judge. And as the, a law clerk, you just write all day long. That's what you do. You read and you write. And I love to write. So when I first started teaching, I taught writing. And I still love to write. And so I try to teach a writing class every time, every chance that I get. And one of the, one of the classes that I teach is judicial writing, which is tons of fun for me because I get to go and read and all the stuff that I used to do as a law clerk. And then also be able to teach that to my students and have them kind of analyze things in a different way from within the court, which is a very, very different way of analysis than um, outside the court as an advocate. Uh, and then I teach a couple little other classes as well, public speaking for lawyers. It's a really important class. Um, you have to know how to speak, obviously, right, in addition to being able to 
right now. And it can be a very difficult class, believe it or not. Um, to stand up there and you know, have the whole show in front of you for a long time is not as easy as it appears. And then interviewing and counseling and a couple other types of classes like that. So I teach all kinds of classes. I love it. I love my job. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you sometime over the next three years, hopefully. So what I want to do today is kind of give you a little bit of an insight, and you might already have one to an extent, but a little bit of an insight as to how a law school class can operate at times. There's all different ways, obviously, that a teacher can choose to operate his or her class. The traditional method, the, the uh, method that everyone always thinks of when they think of law school is the Socratic method, right? You, you basically pick on one person and you hound them for 45 minutes and they're sweating the whole time and their face is bright red and they have that horrible nerve up their spine and everyone else in the class just sits back and watches them and says, thank goodness it's not me, right? Um, that's one way of doing it and that's a really effective way, by the way. I mean, it seems like it might not be, but it, it can be extremely effective, especially if you don't know if you're gonna get called on, right? So you always have to be ready. It's one of the great benefits of the Socratic method. It's also great because it forces you to answer questions. You're then being an active learner and not a passive learner. Anytime you can be an active learner, pick it. No matter how difficult it is, pick the harder path. You'll be happier than you did at the end. Um, the other type of class that you see from time to time is just a straight lecture. Sometimes I have to do that. Sometimes I have to give you information. And I basically tell you, just listen to me, take notes. I'm not asking for anybody to volunteer anything at all. I'll take as many questions as I can at the end of class. You can always come and see me. But I need to give you this information because if I don't get this information to you today, we can't move forward, right? And we'll work on it in subsequent classes, but I just need to kind of spit it all out at you today, okay? Um, and sometimes it works best with some particular information like that. Um, other types of ways that we do classes at times are basically skills-based. So we'll give you a problem and we'll all work through it together. That's what we're going to do today. We also do a flipped classroom, and I know many of you have probably had some experience with that in the past, where I do in some of my classes, I'll actually record the lecture ahead of time, and you as a student have to watch the lecture, and oftentimes I'll have a quiz based upon the lecture and the readings so that you can't just say, hey, yes, I watched it, you know. Um, it doesn't, doesn't do you any good to not watch it, believe it or not. Uh, so, I'll report it ahead of time, you watch the lecture, you answer some questions prior to class, and then we come in and we work in what we already learned. Okay, so we get a little bit of both. You get a lecture and then you get some active learning. Um, and then there's a hybrid. There's all different ways to do it, right? And every teacher works a little bit differently, every class is a little bit different. I try to mix it up as much as I can so that my students have access to different learning or different teaching styles and are able to work with whatever style they're given. Because when you're out there and you're practicing as an attorney, you have to deal with all different kinds of people. Some people you'll like very much, other people you will not like at all, but you still have to work with them and deal with them. Okay? Some judges require certain things, other judges require other things. You kind of just have to figure out what, what is best so that you can best represent your client. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a professional responsibility um, issue, a short, fairly easy professional responsibility issue, and we're going to work through it together. And part of what we're going to do is not necessarily for the sake of really learning the area of law in PR, but we're just going to start to think like lawyers, start to think about legal analysis. How does a lawyer go about analyzing a situation, right? And on the one hand, I can say it's not like anything you've done before in your life, but on the other hand, I can say it's like everything that you've done before in your life. Okay? We're just putting a name to it. That's all we're doing here. Okay? So nothing to necessarily be afraid of. Um, so what does thinking like a lawyer mean? Right? You have a set of facts that are given to you or that you get out of the client. Right? Then you have to determine whether or not what you can do with those facts. Is that something that uh, would be a cause of action for your client? Is that something that's a valid defense for your client? Things like that. And then after that you have to take a look and say, well, are there any rules? Is there a constitutional issue here? Are there any statutes, regulations that may apply? Is there any case law on the matter? Okay. But basically what I always tell people is being a lawyer and analyzing a problem is asking every single question that you can think of 
and then answering them. <coughs> and after you've gone through, and you might have 10 pages worth of questions, by the way, and that's okay, it's good. Sometimes you have three questions, sometimes you have 33. <coughs> you go through every question you have, and one question, the answer to one question, they spark three more. You just keep asking questions, asking questions, asking questions until you have an answer to every question that you've asked. Or there is no answer. And then what do you do when there's no answer? You have to do the best you can with it, right? And say, well, there's no official answer here, but here's based on everything else what, what I would argue. Okay? All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to pass out um, some stuff here. We're going to split you all in half, and we have a nice break right here, so I don't have to worry about calling out numbers or having anyone by their height or by their uh, birthday in the year, which is sometimes what I do. All right. So, and feel free to work with a partner or a small group of three or four or whatever. I love group work because it forces you to talk and think and not be passive. I just want you to go ahead and read through these paragraphs. I need is my face right there. Mm -hmm. so I think that's enough, but if it's not. see what questions should we already be thinking and asking of ourselves when we start. If you don't have your own copy, just sit with your partner because I'm out of copies, only made 50 and we have many people in the room. That's great, more than Aaron. Get a friend, because law school is a lot easier with a friend. <laughs> Trust me, it's really hard by yourself. Get a, a good little group of friends. Jessica can tell you, right? Yes, they're helpful. Life is a lot easier for the next three years when you have a friend or two, right? Emotional support. What? Emotional support. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I'm sure the people that just took the bar can tell you that also, right? <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at the first paragraph. So your client is a defendant in an employment discrimination suit brought in a state court by Joseph Salinas. So Selena is the plaintiff, his wife Sarah is also a plaintiff, his son James is also a plaintiff, each of whom is employed by the defendant. They claim that the defendant denied their promotions, rates, and preferred job assignments because of their Hispanic ancestry. So what do we have? We have an employment discrimination lawsuit. We have three plaintiffs and family. They claim they haven't been gotten certain promotion settings because of their ancestry, their background. Okay? Judge granted your motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. What does that mean? Okay. So Salinas filed a lawsuit, filed a complaint. What you did as the defense counsel was there's nothing to this at all. You're saying based upon, it's called a 12B6 motion in the federal civil procedure, but it's a state court. But what you're basically saying is on the four corners of this complaint, there is nothing that states a cause of action at all. Right? You're saying there's no case here. Filed that motion. Judge said, yeah, I agree. All right? We're going to dismiss that. Um, so the judge grants the motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. Now, interestingly, the judge makes his decision solely on the basis of a novel interpretation of the applicable statute, which, by the way, is an interpretation that you didn't argue, okay, but he, he or she kind of just said, oh, no, I think it's this, right? And that's what was in the decision. Um, and probably inconsistent with the prior decision of the state Supreme Court. Okay, so, so let's, take it, let's make it like a really... Has nothing to do with the law. It 
That's usually how I always figure things out. Okay. So you put your dog in your backyard, and you put the fence around your backyard to keep your dog in your backyard. Okay. And the reason why, the reason why you need to have a fence in your backyard is that the dog doesn't get out and get hit by a car, right? So that's a valid reason, okay? So you go and you tell somebody, this is why we need to have the fence. And they say, I agree. We definitely need to have a fence to make sure that dog doesn't eat those lollipops. See what I mean? Agreeing with you, in fact, what you need to do but for a completely different reason, which may actually be wacko, okay, in a way, right? Inconsistent with what the statute says, right? So that's basically what's going on here. All right, so the, the counsel for the plaintiff makes clear his intention to appeal, right? Well, I don't like this decision. We're gonna appeal this because we don't think that, you know, this should have been dismissed and the reasoning is wrong also, okay? You are persuaded the trial court's rationale will not stand, though you think that your theory for your motion to dismiss is still arguable. So what are you saying? Yeah, I, I totally, you know, in the back of in your own private meetings, you're saying, yeah, I, I totally get this. The lollipop thing is not going to stick, but we don't want him to get hit by a car, right? So when it goes up on appeal, it's probably still going to be okay, maybe, but it's not going to be because of the lollipop stuff, right? Okay. So shortly thereafter, you learn that virtually on the day of the trial court's ruling, Joseph Selena dies of natural causes, okay? This is before the appeal occurs, and now one of the plaintiffs is now dead. Next paragraph, Council of Oaks Lane is now filed his notice of appeal with four days to spare in the appeal period. You see immediately the notice of appeal carries the caption Joseph Salina et al. The body of the notice simply refers to the plaintiffs. You are aware that the State Court of Appeals relying on a State Supreme Court interpretation of the applicable procedural rules will treat this failure to name each party individually as jurisdictional. I'll explain what that means in a minute. With respect to the unnamed parties and will dis dismiss the appeal out of those parties on its own motion but not until after the appeal period has expired. Okay, so basically what happened is plaintiff's counsel then goes and files the appeal on the caption of the appeal says Selena's et al. But there's a statute that says that you can't do that. You have to actually name each of the parties under this particular statute, okay? So they messed up, okay? They messed up. The court's gonna dismiss it on its own, but it's gonna take a little bit of time. There's still four days left. You explain the error to your client on the day that you receive a notice, including the fact that for the next four days, their counsel will be able to correct that error, amend it and correct it, all right? Um, so you basically tell your client uh, that the appeal could be successful on the merits. You might have to go to trial on the wife's sons and claims. They may come back down because they may have a good argument, right? But I still think that we can win this, okay? Your client then says, look, I know you lawyers stick together and all that, but don't even think about talking to the other guy. We'll just see how smart he is. So your client doesn't want anything said. Your client wants that four days to run and let the appeal period lapse and then all is said and done, okay? So you then explain to your client that you think the right thing to do is to inform the opposing counsel of the mistake. You also reiterate that you believe you're gonna win on appeal regardless of the procedural mishap. And even if you don't win on appeal, you're probably gonna win back and down and get to the trial court. So you decide to tell opposing counsel who in turn amends the notice of appeal with me all the time frame. You decide, I have to tell him. I'm sorry, I can't. Tell him. Okay? It's professional courtesy. It, you just, I can't do it. Okay? And then your client reports it to the appropriate state bar authorities and says, well, you know the answer to this one. You don't you? Yep. She's in my PR class as well. So. Um, whether there's an answer or not, I'm not quite sure, right? So um, basically, you get reported. Okay? And now what we're here to do is to determine whether or not you, which we're going to morph into him or her, okay, the attorney for the defendants should be subject to discipline or should be disciplined for basically alerting the other side of the problem, which then allowed them to amend it, okay? And it changed some things that happened within the case, potentially, all right? So what I want you to do, and we're almost out of time, what I want you to do with your little group is I want you without any law at all just to talk for two minutes on whether you think that this person should be um, disciplined or not. Um, and tell me what you think. And don't worry about the two questions on the bottom. <laughs>
opposite sides of the room, and then you feel like strength and numbers and the fighting starts. It's awesome. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's like every time I can do that, I'll just, I'll just really get vested in it. It's amazing. It's awesome. But we don't have time to do that today because I'm already to talked too much. So. All right, so somebody who said that the attorney should be disciplined, somebody who said the attorney should be disciplined, if you would like to be so bold, tell us why. Go ahead. Well, we were thinking that... Um, you said that out of professional courtesy, which meant that there was no legal obligation to disclose the error. Okay. So um, with his client's wishes, he, we went against his client's wishes uh, based off professional courtesy. And I would argue that there's a lot of things that are professionally courteous, but it doesn't mean you disclose it to the other side. Unless there's some, some precedents. Right. Some okay. What else on the should side? Especially that the client specifically asked them not to. Oh, okay. Client specifically said no. Correct. Anything else? The attorney has a fiduciary responsibility to represent his client, not the other attorney. Okay. I was going to say basically the same thing, but 
duty to do the most good for their client versus harm. Okay, so your duty to the client, right? And actually, the, over all of professional responsibility is this, idea, is this idea of duty of loyalty, right? So you're always grappling with the difference between being an officer of the court and being an advocate for your client. And sometimes the court wins, and sometimes the client wins, right? So it's this idea of this duty of loyalty that you owe, duty of confidentiality, which is also part of the duty of loyalty as well. Um, so we'll do loyalty here. Okay. So who on this side wants to tell me what you think? Should not be this one. Go ahead. Um, I feel like in order for, for an attorney to be considered incompetent in like, his decision, he would have to have changed the entire outcome of the case. And he repeatedly said that the, the appeal would win on the merit. So it wouldn't change the Okay, that's a great thought, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna give a little give a little tiny little caveat right now. You you are making a really good point, and that brings to the difference between a disciplinary violation which deals with the breach of trust and an actual malpractice cause of action, where the result would have been different had you been quote unquote competent under Model Rule 1.1. Okay? So you can actually bring a disciplinary bar authority type. Right, um, cause so, so to speak, report right to the bar, even if there's nothing officially bad, so to speak, that happened with that client's case. They're two separate systems. But you're thinking, and I like it because it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Right. So maybe it should be dependent upon that. But it's a different, it's a different system, right? Okay. But good. Go ahead. His actions were done in good faith. The information that the attorney told the other attorney would be more regarding clerical error than actual discrimination. So it's just a clerical error. And that kind of gets back to what she was saying about it didn't really change the outcome of the case at all, right? Okay, so we'll put those two together for that. Okay, go ahead and turn over the sheet that I gave you. If you don't have it in front of you, get with your group and find it. And uh, what we're looking at now is model rule of professional conduct 1.2. The way the model rules operate real quick are the, the, the American Bar Association promulgated the model rules. They're not binding on any particular state. States can adopt them or they can adopt some form of them. So this is not particularly binding on any one individual person. It's advisory. However, many if not most states have adopted them in large part if not in total. Okay? Um, when you take professional responsibility, you learn the model rules of professional conduct because the NPRE, which is our multi-state professional responsibility exam, which is part of the bar exam, tests you on the model rules because how do you know where you're going to be, right? And so each particular state bar has opted either in or out of actually testing you on that state's professional conduct rules as well. So wherever it is that you're practiced, you may have to know both of them for the exam. Wherever you end up to officially practice, you have to know the rules of that state, right? So we have the rules regulating the Florida bar. That's what you have to follow in the state of Florida. Okay, you can't say, well, it was okay, the model rules told me I could do it. No, right? Because they're not binding upon anybody, okay? So what does 1.2 tell us? It's the scope of representation, allocation of authority between client and lawyer. Why is this relevant? So we have a lot of time, so yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, sorry, it's eliminating the uh, lawyer's responsibilities to his client. Lawyer's responsibility to his client. Key words in there, objectives versus means, right? The client, who, I'm sorry, who's responsible for the objectives of the representation? Who gets to make the decisions on the objectives according to the, to the regulation itself, according to the rule? The client, right? The client gets to say, I want this objective, okay? There's a difference, though, between objectives, which we think of as more broad-based, right, and means, which is the way to get to that objective, right? So when we talk about means, what does the, what does the rule say about the means? It says that the lawyer will consult the client. Right. The lawyer shall consult with the client as the means by which they are to be pursued, right? Now, there are some things where the lawyer actually makes the decision on that, right? And if there's a big hubbub about it between the lawyer and the client, then maybe there's a possibility of termination of representation. But it's still, I mean, the client still has a say within the means, right? So how do we then take the objectives versus means 
language that we see in this rule and now apply it to our case. And let me real quick tell you, I only have about one minute on my left. Can I have one minute? Okay, good. So, so the reason I gave you the facts first is because I wanted you to see that the law starts from a place of common sense, or at least it should, right? Before you have any rules at all, you have common sense, right? What you think should be done. And a group of people ultimately decide what the rules should be going forward, right? Oftentimes, you can find the right answer without the law before you even see the law. Now, sometimes that's not the case, okay? But a lot of times it is. So you want to start with what, what do you think? Let's take a look at what the law says, right? Is there a regulation or a statute that tells me what I have to do? I mean, rules basically tell us what we can't do, right? And then case law tells us what we can do. Case law says, well, this is what the rule means, and you can't do this underneath the rule, right? So what do the objectives and the means tell us about answering this question? What is an objective of this representation? It's not telling the other side an objective. So is the objective to have the case not move forward anymore, to meaning that it's done right now, or is the objective of the client to win the case? <laughs> See what I mean? All right? Are you look it's broad, narrow, broad, narrow, right? So is the objective overall I ultimately want to win this case? That's the objective. That's really the only thing as a client I have full control over. And the lawyer can kind of step in there and kind of massage, but guide me through the means to getting toward that objective. Or is it an objective, is it a valid objective of mine to have this thing finished now? And how does that affect what the lawyer can and can't do because of it, right? All right, I'm going to give you one more thing, and we're not going to have time to go through it completely, but we talk about what the facts say. We, we ask whether or not there's actually a rule, right? A statute, a regulation, is it a constitutional type principle? Something that starts out with broad application. And then we take a look and we say, okay, well, is there any case law? By the way, this is all part, right? Is there any case law that we can point to that helps us to interpret what that rule means? Right? So that's what the cases do. The cases say, here's what 1.2 says. Here's what it means. And then what do we do as lawyers? We say, see this case, Your Honor? I win, right? <laughs> or, see this case, Your Honor? <sighs> Makes no sense. Kick it out of here. It's so distinguishable, right? We're not even going to apply it. But that's where you get to be the lawyer, right? That's where you get to work within what that says. So I'm going to hand this out. Um, I don't think we have any time to talk about it, but you can take a look at it. What it is, uh, what I've done is I've taken a case, a real case, I basically just outlined the general facts that are important. So that it's a quick read for you. This is, not, this is not what a case will look like when you get it, by the way. Okay? So I've outlined the, the big facts, the key facts, and what that will do is kind of, you should start thinking to yourself, okay, well, what facts in this case are similar to the case that we have, right? How is it different? How is it the same, right? And then I've taken a quick little squib or excerpt from the majority opinion, and then on the back, I have a quick little excerpt from the dissenting opinion, okay? So I want you to determine, and you can do this on your own, you don't have time, but I want you to determine whether or not you think that this case applies or is it distinguishable, right? Um, if it applies, then we're going to probably go one way, if it's distinguishable, it's going to be another way. So what is, it, what is similar about this case, what's different? And I will tell you, I think you can make a really good argument on either side, a really good argument. So as far as this... Okay, so I'll take questions while I hand these out. Can, can a judge go with the dissenting opinion even though it was not important? You mean in a future case? <laughs> yes, but basically what you're doing is you're just adopting that reasoning. So it's a new opinion. So it's 
suing his employer. So it was personal injury, PI, and he files a complaint, serves it on the defendant, the defendant sends it to his insurance company, the insurance company sends it to the attorneys for the insurance company, right? The attorney the attorney for the insurance company, I think asks for extension of time, right? Files a motion for extension of time, which you pretty much get all the time. So does I need a little bit more time to answer? And unfortunately something happens then, okay? The secretary for the law firm, by mistake, sends the sends the, the answer or the motion for extension of time back to the insurance company, and it never gets filed with the court. It never gets sent to the plaintiff. Okay, so it's kind of in limbo. So plaintiff's attorney thinks there's no response at all. Ultimately, moves for a default judgment. Okay, and says, well, then we should win because you didn't respond. Um, has a hearing, explains things with the judge, and the judge enters that default judgment. There's a certain amount of time after the default judgment uh, before it becomes officially final. And um, defendant had the opportunity to have that set aside, basically, right? Uh, but didn't even know that default judgment existed. So before the time for setting, for setting aside the default judgment had expired, the defendant's counsel files that answer, okay? So now plaintiff's counsel's like, what? Where is this answer from? I already have a judgment against this other party. Um, talks to the plaintiffs about it and notes that he could call the other side and inform them there was a default judgment. It meant the plaintiff could potentially lose that verdict, right? Doesn't mean they're going to ultimately lose in the end. They're just going to have that default judgment set aside, so it's actually going to be a live case again. Um, and the plaintiff basically does the same thing, more or less, right? Then was done in our case that we were looking at. It says, don't do it. I have my default judgment. I want it to become valid, and I want to walk away. I don't want to have to deal with this, okay? And um, plaintiff's lawyer waits until the 30-day time period expires, then waits an additional 10 days, past the time to appeal the default, and then finally tells the defendant's attorney there's a default judgment, okay? Sorry. So, hmm? 
Yeah, waves, okay? So um, D, the defense attorney moves to have the, the judgment set aside, um, and so the critical issue in the case becomes something very similar to what we talked about, right? Which is, was the attorney right in basically waiting, waiting this thing out? Okay? So you have a little bit of a standard from the majority opinion, you have a little bit of a standard from the dissenting opinion. Um, is there anything that's a little bit different in this case? Because I think when you first make it, you're like, oh, same thing, no problem. You can't do that. That's bad. Because the majority opinion says he did what he could do, right? The attorney's responsibility as an advisor of his client on an adversary system to do what he did. He was, of course, more than an advisor. He was an advocate. An advocate, a lawyer, zealously asserts the client's position on the rules of the adversary system. He told his client, he explained the situation. They shared the decision of the action to follow. It was consistent with Rule 1.2, right? Um, Default judgment was entered. Plaintiff attorney had no duty to inform the defendant or his attorney that a judgment had been entered. Right? Does it seem exactly the same as what we have here? Or is it a little bit different? Do you think it's different? Do you think it's exactly the same? One thing is different. So the explanation um, here, it's talking how talking about how the plaintiff's lawyer waited an additional 10 days after the 30-day expiration. Uh -huh. And then here, um, in the mock one, it, it just explains how he, um, he didn't wait to the expiration. I don't see that he did that here. Unless I missed something. No, 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 you're right. I feel like the, the dates are like he kind of he did respect his client's wishes, but waited until the expiration date. Okay, good. So thinking of it just in terms of taking the taking the client out of it for just a minute and looking at the attorney's action itself, right? Should because it's, it is a little bit different than that. Procedurally speaking, right, for what was actually done. Good to pick up on that. What should the attorney have informed the other side in this case or not? Because the, then the question becomes very similar to should the attorney have informed our client in this case or not, right? So is there anything different leading up to the decision basically not to tell that we can point to and say, well, there was something about this case that might have been a little bit worse or more egregious. Anything in there? Uh, I, I, maybe I missed it in, in the original case. But, uh, here it says that the client, after communicating with the client, explained the situation in explicit terms. They shared the decision, which in the original case it didn't seem like they shared it since the okay, uh, still to do it. okay. So what would that lead you to? Well, he, here there was a, 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 an understanding between the client and the attorney, uh, whereas in the other one, it, there could have been the termination of services or, or whatever. Right? Okay. So I'm going to notify the other attorney, the other client. Okay. I think it's, um, that him saying that him saying that to the other attorney doesn't change it at all because they already had a, a default judgment against him. They were going to go and collect that third anyways. And the defendant's attorney would have found out a week later when they went to try and collect the money, um, or whatever they were trying to collect. Well, that basically, what happened in this, basically what happened in the present case is, had he informed him, it would have given the other side time to have that default judgment set aside, mm -hmm. that you couldn't collect on it, mm -hmm. right? So he chose not to inform him, and then his client benefited from it, right? In our case, the client did not benefit from it as we can see, right? Because they, the, the amendment was made and the appeal actually went through. Would it matter? It seems like in the other case, it's reversed. It, the other one was the defendant, now it's the plaintiff. Would it matter in a case like that? And does it have to be specifically? No, like, and that is a great question. Okay. Because you're going to come across cases where the same action was not done, right? Or there's something procedurally that seems a little bit off, right? Yeah. Um, or one case can be based upon a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim, while another case can be based upon a decision on a summary judgment, which is later on in the litigation timeline. But you can still use that case oh. for the substance of it, right? Okay. Unless, of course, the reason why you're using it is for the summary judgment language, <laughs> and the motion to dismiss language doesn't help yeah. you, right? Okay. So oftentimes, the, the underlying case law, what I always try to tell my students is that you have, you have the substance, and the substance can be the substance can be tort law, it can be criminal law, it can be contracts, it can be anything, anything at all, right? Um, and then you have procedure. It's always floating over it, right? And the procedure can change everything. Where are you 
in that timeline. That's going to dictate at times what arguments you can make. It's going to dictate um, basically what you can do, what kind of things you can file, what questions you can ask. What, you know, it, so this is always going to be there. I always tell my students also that this person that knows these rules is going to win sometimes even if they don't have the substance behind them. Because a person with the substance behind them that doesn't have any idea what the rules say, they're going to lose because they don't know how to play the system. They don't know how to use the rules to help them with the substance. Okay, so that can happen sometimes as well. All right. Take a look real quick at the dissent. Is anybody persuaded by the dissent? Yeah. Okay, we gotta go. So. All right, well thank you very much. I'm happy to be here with you. Hope you have a wonderful remainder of the day and I hope to see you all. Walk in the halls sometime in the next few years.